Alero. Now, David, um, you trace the origins of Boko Haram. For those that have not read your book and are very interested on the, uh, in the origin of Boko Haram, please, can you concisely detail it for us? Right. So um, the story that is typically called, that is typically told starts with a man called uh, Mohammed Yusuf, who apparently is a charismatic Islamic preacher, a, a, a Salafi preacher, who gathers a following in the uh, mid to late noughties. And then um, eventually his followers uh, stage an uprising against the police, against the Nigerian state, and then they are massacred, they are arrested, he's shot dead. And then his deputy, Abu Akashikao, takes over. And to all intents and purposes, that's what we know as Boko Haram. Um, that's where what we know as Boko Haram starts. In reality, um, that's like starting a story in the middle of the book. The beginning of the story actually starts in the 1970s, and I trace this in the article. So it starts with the activities of a man called uh, Abu Bakr Mahmoud Gumi, who was an Islamic scholar who uh, used South, uh, funding, uh, training, and uh, uh, material support from Saudi Arabia to effectively set up a Wahhabi stroke Salafi uh, Islamic movement in Nigeria. Bear in mind that up, to, up until that point, the, the type of Islam practiced in Nigeria and the way it was practiced was relatively benign. So it was a sort of like, it was, it was a Sufi brand of Islam. The Sufi, uh, two major Sufi brotherhoods existed, the Kadriya, Kodriya Brotherhood and the Tijaniya Brotherhood. Now, this Islamic scholar, Sheikh Mahmoud Gumi, introduced this new thing, this, uh, this, this thing called Salafism, which was fueled by the Wahhabi ideology that was exported by Saudi Arabia uh, at that time, and which they still do to, to date. And um, to all intents and purposes, that became the ideological background for what would later become a group known as the Izala movement. Now, um, Sheikh Abu Bakr Gumi at the time, the, uh, that's not the Sheikh Gumi we know, that's uh, Sheikh Gumi's father, uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Abu Bakr Mahmoud Gumi, was a scholar and a teacher who uh, had this very strict sort of Sunni understanding of the Quran. Um, when his friend uh, Ahmad Bello died and he was looking for a new benefactor, he turned to the Saudis and the Saudis were only too happy to flood into Nigeria with their ideology and their money and their training and whatnot. And so the Izala movement grew out of this Saudi indoctrination in the 1970s. Um, eventually, the group was uh, was officially formulated by one of uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr Gumi's followers, uh, Sheikh Idris. And to all intents and purposes, that was the start of what we now know as the Izala movement, also known as Jibwis. Now, over the next few decades, Jibwis would rise in its influence across northern Nigeria it will become a strong political force. In many parts of Northern Nigeria, it will become practically impossible to obtain any kind of significant power opposition without identifying with the Zala movement or being approved by it, right? So now, um, in the mid, in, in the early noughties, right, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fellow known as, uh, uh, is, 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 a, is, a, is an Islamic preacher in Katina. His name is, um, Sorry, let me just get to this right. His name is uh, Yakubu Kafanchan. He's also known as uh, Yakubu Musa Hassan. He's also known as uh, the Yakubu Musa Katsina. Now, according to a document submitted by the Nigerian government to uh, a UN committee on counterterrorism, and this document was submitted in, in 2006, um, this fellow, this uh, Yakubu Musa Kafanchan, aka Yakubu Musa Katsina, was arrested in 2002 by the Nigerian security agencies for trying to set up Taliban training camps in Nigeria and for trying to set up terror cells in Kano and in Katsina. This was as far back as 2002. And uh, the same letter mentioned someone, uh, someone else as an accomplice of his, a man called Haruna Shahru. Now, uh, Haruna Shahru is described in that letter as an agent of an Islamist group called GSPC. And what he does for them is that he finances extremism by laundering uh, uh, money through uh, the, his, his network of businesses which dealt in smuggled goods. And this was a letter that was sent by the Nigerian government itself, by Ambassador Aminu Wali at the time, uh, right. under the Ambassador government. Um, this was sent to the UN. The Nigerian government itself wrote this, right? Yeah. And then in the same letter, um, 
somebody who many people would never not ordinarily associate with terrorism, founder of uh, uh, NASCO group, his name is Ahmed Idris Nasreddin, was also named. Uh, and the letter claimed that uh, due to his being uh, recognized as a global sponsor of terrorism by the US, that his business interests in Nigeria were, uh, were provisionally forfeited to the federal government. Um, I went digging and I, I didn't really find any evidence that this actually took place. Um, as far as I could tell from all the CAC records and from all the other records I get my hands on, Idris Nasreddin yeah. never actually uh, lost control of his company for a single day. Hmm. Um, but that's what they put in the letter anyway. Right. And then there's other documentation there's, backing this up. So, sorry, so just to interrupt, David, there's a lot of, uh, as we recall, as we call it, receipts in the book. There's a lot of heavily researched uh, evidence that you have put in there. I don't want to give everything away for the sake of time, but we want to ask, first of all, how long did it take to research um, such a lengthy document? And what were some of the challenges to getting uh, the information that you got? And also, what it has been the reception thus far? Because um, it's quite detailed, as I said, and it seems that a lot of the information that has been shared if it would be shared with the public, has it been shared with the higher ups? And are they aware? And if they're aware, what is being done? Uh, so in answer to the first question, how long did it take? Um, I would say surprisingly, um, in terms of actually putting it together um, after the research, was the, the research was the longest part. So maybe that took the best part of maybe a couple of months. But the actual drafting, believe it or not, came together in about five or six hours. It wasn't. It, it, it actually wasn't. That. Research is always the most difficult part. Now, um, with regard to uh, the, the, you asked the question that what has the the reception? Been? Yes. Well, the reception has been. Um, it, there's a very large majority who are absolutely stunned at the existence. Okay, let me go back to the previous question you asked, which was how difficult was it to gain access to these materials? Right. Um, what I discovered that there's actually a wealth of material uh, that is available on the, the early days of Boko Haram and of Islamic terrorism in Nigeria. So there's, the, um, and these are typically academic works written by the likes of uh, Dr. Andrea Brigadia, who used to work at uh, the University of Cape Town uh, in the Institute of, of Contemporary Islam there. He did a lot of extensive work, but the problem is that a lot of this work, it's available on the internet, mm. but it's locked behind um, academic paywall. So you need like, for example, a, a JSTOR login or a, 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 a JSTOR pass, which might be like $6 or something. So because of something as little as $6, a lot of this information just lies on the internet completely undiscovered forever. Wow. Right. And so basically some of this information came by virtue of we have actually having access to this academic database. So I can actually search on Google and then click through and actually find it without having to you know, pay because I have access to these databases. And there is a wealth of information that is available. Like this, the challenge was actually keeping this thing to the length that I was able to keep it to because there was so much more that I couldn't even fit it. The reception has been mixed, as I said. Um, the vast majority of people who have seen it are absolutely shocked that this information exists, that there are official Nigerian documents stating that this uh, Yakubu Musa Kapanchan or Yakubu Musa Katina fellow, who was uh, recognized by the Nigerian government itself as a somebody setting up terror cells in 2002, as an Islamic terrorist, gets to take pictures with the president in Asorok, right? And he's a close friend of you know uh, the Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, Musa Pantami. And people are surprised that wow, how does all of this exist? And then there's a small minority of people who uh, are determined to discredit the work for obvious reasons. Some for um, for reasons of their, what they consider to be their religious or their ethnic affiliations. Some for reasons of petty professional envy. I'm not going to get into that, but there, 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 there have been those too. But the vast majority, I have to say, has been overwhelmingly positive. And I would say has generated a fair bit of um, I would say something approaching panic. All right, David. For the first time. Um, for the brevity of time, would you permit me to, let me just um, throw this one in here, because this is almost like the whole Fahrenheit 9-11 all over again. Explosives, 
how many explosive stuffs are really being put out there, revelations being made? Because you actually called out several key people, some in, in our present government today. Are you scared for your life? And do you think this will spark the needed flame to begin to probably unearth some of this heathen chords that's probably or the strings that are literally pulling things and actually are the ones behind the works making things happen without us seeing them? So uh, with regards to the first question, am I scared for my life? What I would say is that I think um, we sometimes give um, the powers that be a bit too much credit um, as powerful as, as they might be, as much of a global reach as they might claim to have they're really not that powerful and they're really not that competent because with you know with all the the obvious strategy and planning that has gone into this something as simple as you know keeping your village safe i mean the other day you had the minister of defense there was a there was a video of him walking into his car with a machine gun the minister of defense is holding a machine gun and his personal sidearm walking into his car so the minister of defense doesn't feel safe on the road so if you if the minister of defense hasn't been able to sort out his personal safety then I think my personal safety is somewhere across the Atlantic. That is, you know, the Nigerian government or the Nigerian establishment or the Zala establishment, whatever it is, has bigger problems and you know shouldn't even be trying to go after David and Dane because I mean I, I'm, I'm not sure they can drive to their villages right now. I'm not sure the road to their villages uh, is secure. And then secondly, um, you asked that will this spark? something um the only people that, that can answer that question are nigerians themselves because i don't think this is the first time that someone is putting out information that could potentially be epoch defining you know as i remember in april i was i was on this show i was on this tv station i was talking about the uh Issa Patami story and at the time it seemed as if that was the you know the pen the pen uh the the coin drop moment where the penny finally dropped and people finally realize that this is what is happening. But as we saw, the Nigerian government simply decided to be transigent and eventually people moved on to other things. So it's up to the Nigerian people themselves in this case, decide whether they're, they're going to play the same game this time around and move on after shouting for a couple of weeks, or if this is going to lead to an actual permanent mentorship. 